Well, there isn't too much going on now. The trees are dormant and they're just kind of waiting for their, their rest period to break at the end of the spring. But this time of year we're doing some pruning. That's the main wintertime activity. Um, you know, right now it looks like it's all dead. But, uh, and, uh, you know, the first thing, the trees will bloom. The leaves will start to come out. Then you start to see small apples start to form. And, uh, yeah, week by week you can watch those little apples grow. And, Eventually, by September and October, they're big enough to eat. Uh, my dad started this company in 1946, I think, and uh, he's passed away many years ago. And my brother and I have taken it over, and and now my son David is getting involved a little bit. So, but yeah, we've been here for a long time, gone through a lot of a lot of changes though. In the uh, 50s and 60s, everything was conventional. Most apples went to Los Angeles or San Francisco, loose pack boxes. Conventional pest control was, was largely a, a calendar activity. You know, you, you sprayed every two weeks or you sprayed every week. Um, and then starting in the 80s, you, you started to see more interest in integrated pest management and alternatives to spraying by the calendar. You started doing more scouting and, and only spraying when you absolutely needed to. Then in the 90s we converted over to organic, so that uh, you know everything we do now is organic. There's no conventional at all left anymore. But with our size operation, we were too small to compete with Washington State in the conventional market, and our markets were going away. Just like all uh, the whole Paro Valley it used to have 12, 15,000 acres of apples. Now we're down to about two. And uh, you know, so in the, in the late 80s, we started to see this, uh, this trend of acreage declining. Uh, you know, we weren't able to compete with Washington State, so we looked for a niche, and uh, organic was uh, the most likely niche it looked like for us, and it's worked out successfully. You know, yields, I think, probably are a little bit less than what we were used to in the uh, mid-80s. Um, but I'm not sure it's completely due to the difference between cultural uh, practices due to organic and conventional. Um, it may have just been that the, um, the weather and the climate was different in those times, uh, different varieties. Um, but we don't really think we're losing production necessarily due to organic. Right. It certainly is more costly. But uh, I think production-wise, we're probably okay. You know, there is no conventional apples grown in this area for fresh market. The only thing is going to juice. And we'd have been out of business if we hadn't converted over to organic. Um, there was just, it's, it's not feasible to grow conventional apples for fresh market here. Part of it has to do with, with Santa Cruz and this area just being kind of an incubator of organics from the get-go. Uh, CCOF was established in Santa Cruz many, many years ago. And this area, I think, just has kind of, a, of an interest in organics. And the other thing, I think, in this area, too, is that it's not really, it doesn't really lend itself to large-scale farming like over in the valley. And, and so farms are naturally smaller. You know, the Santa Cruz area has been a good market for organics for from the very start. I mean, that's one of the places where organic uh, uh, consumption started, really. You know, the materials we use are pretty benign and stuff like that that are allowed for organic. It's a far cry from the, uh, the old conventional days. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, yeah, we're happier with that. And, uh, but like I said, I think the primary reason we got into it was that Market. we wanted to stay in business and, and we weren't going to be able to do that farming conventionally so but, now there, there's been a lot of advantages I think growing organically I, I think it's it's easier on the crew they don't have to worry about exposure to pesticides and stuff and um, 
you know the materials that we are able to use you don't really have to worry about re-entry intervals and all this conventional farmers you know have to be careful on scheduling their crews to allow the required number of days before they can go back into a field and so on you know we don't need to worry about that particularly and, uh, but there are a few problems too we have a tremendous problem with snails hmm. they you know, we, we don't clean cultivate. It's it's um, it's kind of a lost cause to do that. We allow a certain amount of grass and, and weeds, and uh, and that makes wonderful habitat for snails. They love it, and uh, so we have to send crews through and pick snails off by hand. Now we've we've tried a number of different things. There's um, there is a uh, snail bait that is allowed for organics now um, but it's not really very effective and we find that we still need to to use some other methods on some of our more sensitive trees uh, varieties that are more sensitive to snails will actually put copper bands on the base of the tree then the copper band will uh, or supposed to in any way hinder the snails from climbing up the tree so it, it works a little bit, but we still end up with a fair amount of hand picking of snails off the tree. You know, this area is very, um, very high land value prices. There's a lot of crops that will grow around here. Um, we've got, you can see the houses over next to us there with raspberries. Um, it, it's possible that, you know, we could make more money actually renting this ground out for raspberries or something then we could uh, grow in our own stuff yeah so you know you don't know we'll, we'll keep doing as long as we can but uh, uh, you never know what's going to happen in the future uh, I think this area will continue to be involved in agriculture in some sort uh, you know we've got pretty much ideal climate there's good soil uh, water is a real problem um, and uh, and encroaching urbanization is another problem, so we'll have to see.